What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Big Dog's got to eat fantasy football. As always, it's your boy Nick. Today we're doing something very different. I had a couple of people, subscribers, reach out to me. They do a podcast. They're involved in a podcast network. Kids, Jeff and Julian, right around my age. They write a little bit and they co host a podcast for sportsradiodetroit.com, online podcast network. They also do an individual podcast, Out of Bounds Detroit Sports. I don't even really know what we're doing, to be honest with you. But they reached out, they said they like my stuff, let's collab. I said, is it hot in the summer, bro? Y'all wanna collab? Name a time, name a place, I'm there. So that's what we're doing today. Since they podcast, they're gonna be on Strictly Audio. So they're gonna be recording me through something called Discord. I don't know if any of you guys are gamers or something, but apparently that's big there. I, I had no idea about it before I got involved with them. And if you're from Detroit, maybe you've heard of them. So I figure well, I'm going to discuss fantasy with them, so I might as well just put it on the channel. It's just a little different take for what I normally do. A lot of you guys probably follow YouTube channel Fantasy Football Advice. If you do, me and them are going to be collabing sometime, I think within the next week or two. So that's dope. If you're not subscribed to their channel, definitely go do that. Fantasy Football Advice. Two kids, I think my age, basically, doing the same shit I do. Paving their own path, saturating the YouTube market, that's what it is. So stay looking out for that collab, it should be a good one. So we're trying to connect. I hear them coming through. Yo, we're just yelling at each other. Like, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Whoa. Worked yeah, for a second and it stopped. All I know is I'm about to bring the fucking noise on this podcast. 30 minutes later, still waiting on audio. Sit here and watch uh, Barstool Pizza Reviews. You should see this setup. I'll take a picture a little further down. It's no glam or glitz. It's all grit, baby. First team all grit. I covered Michigan football for M Live. I covered high school sports for M Live for State Chance High School Sports Show. A lot of football. I've done a lot of fantasy writing. Excellent. Yeah, and Jeff and I have done a little bit of fantasy work together and sort of corresponded the past year and um, definitely knows the stuff. Definitely on uh, on par with the other minds on the show. So the third of which I'll introduce, um, and he is somebody I found on YouTube, and his channel's been uh, definitely getting some pop and some attention lately, um, getting solid views and solid responses from the people watching them. Uh, it is Nick Ercolano from New Jersey. Nick, I'll let you uh, go a little further into your background with fantasy. Yeah, what's up? This is actually kind of funny because uh, I, I don't get nervous when I do my YouTube videos, but I got a little I got a little heartbeat going right now. My experience with fantasy football, as a 24-year-old, it kind of goes back to, I guess, anyone that would be my age. I started probably around the years that, like, Priest Holmes was, was like, the guy at running back. I'm just drafting teams with my friends when I'm, when I'm young, and uh, as it grew in popularity, I got more into it than, I guess, the, the normal person. So I started blogging for myself on my own website eventually reached out to a few um i guess lesser known sites one of them last word on sports and another one called breaking football um excuse me got a call from my mom how dare her inter interrupt the production here anyway so I, I, i've been blogging for probably like three or four years now eventually started the youtube channel big dog's gotta eat fantasy football because i figured podcasting and blogging are pretty saturated right now so if there's any way to kind of like separate yourself just go down that avenue and that's what i found myself doing so i've just been putting out videos pretty consistently for at least this summer. It was a little less the last summer and the one before that, but uh, I don't know. That's, that's really all, all the spiel I got for you right now. I'm, I'm, I'm very into the YouTube scene. Thank you for joining me, Jeff and Nick. We're going to get right into our first show, diving right into a position group that is very interesting this year. I guess it's interesting every year, but it is the running back position, arguably the most fluctuating in terms of its significance and its role the past 10 years. Uh, back in the days that Nick and I were talking about, running back, running back was almost a must in the first two rounds. What's for Portis, maybe it was Priest Holmes and LT, whatever you could do, the role has changed. So we're going to go and walk through, we'll start with maybe the top 10 guys, spend a little bit of time, and we'll get into some of those question marks uh, going forward. A few things that stick out to me, uh, when, when you get to that four, five, six range, and it's almost personal preference when you get into Johnson, Bell, and Elliott, right? Yeah. It's personal preference. They're all very good, and they're all going to be, you know, you're, you're not going to be disappointed unless one gets injured in any of their performances. Would you guys really put... Uh my mindset right now, I actually have Antonio Brown on an overall board ranked higher than Zeke. I, I can't imagine. I mean, obviously, we haven't heard the, the suspension news or anything, 
But I, I kind of put Zeke into the uh, the second tier of running backs. But I, I think Bell and Johnson are in their own man beast category. And then you got Zeke. Yeah, I with think, I agree. I, I think I think uh, Elliott's pretty much the clear number three. I think that's pretty much universal. But I, I also think that um, that you could argue that he'd be the number one you know, running back this year. I think that's a fair argument. Nor- normally, if it was any other year, right? You don't have like like you touched on running backs been so volatile throughout the last like ten years or whatever. And it's, it, I think it just kind of speaks to the evolution of fantasy as, as, as a whole, right? Because it was all standard leagues going back 10 years ago. Now you do a lot of .5 PPR, a lot of PPR, things like that. So obviously, wide receivers are becoming much more relevant. And then you have these top guys who are so involved in the passing game, and you get to you get to Zeke. And, and in most years, you could argue that Zeke would be the number one overall draft pick this year had guys like Bell and Johnson not been around. But then being here, you know, Zeke's not as involved in the passing game. Uh, a little bit of a question mark on the O line because they lost two guys, not their studs or anything, but it is, you know, continuity does, I think, play a role in these kind of things. And you don't know with the suspension. So I, I really would, with the red flags there, kind of throw him into their tier one. He's a tier two by himself. And then the other guys are kind of like a tier three. Yeah, absolutely. As far as the guys four through eight, the way I see it, I feel like McCoy is probably your safest pick. I think he has the least, I think he has the highest floor of that group. Uh, and I think there are a little bit of question marks with guys like um, the trifecta, I'm calling them, Howard, Ajayi, and Gordon. Uh, I have a little bit of concern with each one. My concern with Jordan Howard is that the Bears only had 13 carries inside the five-yard line last year. Uh, I'm not sure if we have reason to believe that the Bears will be a better offense as far as getting down near the goal line. And while touchdowns are the hardest thing to predict, I worry about Howard in that aspect. It's important to running backs. Uh, Gordon, you know, the yards per carry, but there's no real competition behind Gordon. He was very solid last year, but he failed to reach 1,000 yards, and that's a little bit concerning to me. What do you guys think about those those three well, players? Well, I think you're missing Freeman in that. In, in yeah, that. yeah, you can definitely throw Freeman in Because they that, just yeah. paid him the largest contract for a running back right now. And that tells you one thing, at least, is that he's going to be their number one running back. Now, Tevin Coleman, obviously, is very good. He's going to take carries yeah. away, and that's your worry with Devontae Freeman is that Tevin Coleman's going to come and steal some carries away. Sure. Yeah, my worry is actually more with Freeman is, is just the loss of Shanahan. How different is the offense going to look? Yeah, I mean... The- That's probably my only concern when it comes to Freeman. I, I, I'm looking at my tiers right now, and I have Freeman as my, my running back four, right behind Zeke. I have Freeman, McCoy, and Gordon in tier three, I guess you could say, and then DeMarco, Ajayi, Jordan Howard in tier four. I mean, when you're looking at Freeman, you can't even use the Coleman argument as as a realistic thing because it's back-to-back years of production with Coleman there, right? 1,500 total yards, 13 touchdowns. When you look at the goal line numbers, rushes inside the five, Freeman absolutely dominates. But yeah, like you said, I mean, losing Shanahan, it's very possible that this offense takes a step back. I mean, they're bringing in the new OC, uh, Steve Sarkeesian, who really just kind of come out and said, like, he's not going to tweak anything in the offense, which is, you know, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. What are you going to do to the highest scoring offense in the NFL? But behind behind him, I, it is kind of tricky because, of course, you have Melvin Gordon, who, who's the volume play, right? He's going to get 300 touches regardless. McCoy is a little, a little more nerve-wracking for me. I know people are, are saying, like, the floor is high and he's safe, but... He's, he's getting up there in age. You know, he's got a lot of tread on the tires. And I'm not, I, I hate bumping down guys in the ranking just because you say like, oh, he's got a little bit of an injury history because that could happen to anyone realistically. But McCoy didn't have that many. As a team, they were tied with Dallas for the most rushing attempts per game last year. So they are run heavy. But that was also split between McCoy, Mike Gillisley, who's gone now, Tyrod Taylor. So he was actually ranked 17th in the league amongst running backs on uh, rushes per game, which is interesting for them to be such a high volume play. So I'd almost argue that McCoy being the safe volume play is kind of a, a made up story there. A little bit of fool's gold. Yeah, yeah. I, I just feel like I, I, I'm somebody, maybe I'm biased because I drafted him in the third round last year, late third, mm-hmm. uh, which I thought was you know kind of insane. But you know, people always judge recency bias, you know, and it's the reason McCoy got drafted in the late third last year. Yep. And it's the reason he's being drafted in the middle of the first. People look at the previous year um, I think Gillisley being gone is my favorite part about McCoy, to be honest. They don't have anybody outside of McCoy, really. That's yeah. Like, Jonathan Williams that's coming good. up now. Yeah, it, it's true. good in one, on one end where you're, you're like, all right, well, he's going to get the bulk of the carries, right? So you're like, all right. Which he already was getting. Which he already right? was getting, yeah. getting. But then there's also the argument to say, like, all right, you need somebody to split time so this guy 
by week eight or week nine isn't running on fumes already. You yeah, carry the ball twenty times. Yeah, yeah, true. There's a, I do. I hear Nick's point about the tread on the tires. There may be a little bit of a longevity issue. Just like Matt Forte, we saw him come out of the gate crazy last year and fade really hard in like weeks five or six. Yeah. Yeah. And that's right when you try to start getting a feel for your team. You know? Yeah, and I think the other thing with McCoy is, you know, you worry about last year, like if you were a McCoy owner, obviously, you, you were pissed off plenty of times just due to, um, you know, Gillisley is gone, of course, but when you look at the history of, of RB2s there, right, you have Gillisley last year, you had Carlos Williams the year before, that number two role is always there to kind of play play its role and, and score the six to eight touchdowns, and you have Jonathan Williams kind of coming in in this year and it's crazy because like while I'm arguing that point you look at McCoy who had 13 rushing touchdowns and that is no small number by any means the rest of the team though when you look at Taylor Gillisley uh even Reggie Bush and was I think Jonathan Williams took a couple it was like he was actually out rushed in terms of touchdowns like 13 to 18 by the rest of the team so there was like 18 other rushing touchdowns scored that McCoy was not even a part of so there's even more to build on that yeah and that, and that could speak I think that speaks to McCoy's ceiling mm-hmm. uh, I think that that stat right there is proving that um he's not he's probably not going to be a top three back once more I'm not sure what he finished last year I think it was four or five but um, I think a guy, most people think probably a guy like Howard or a giant has a better chance to just explode mm-hmm. uh, this year. But McCoy, I feel like I understand your point, whereas there's just a lot uh, to say about the backup running back in Buffalo. There's just, it has been a carved out role the past few years, even going back to like, I want to say like CJ Stiller and Fred Jackson had kind of like a tandem thing. Yeah, yeah, Fred Jackson uh, was there for fucking season. forever. We'll move on a little bit. Um, we'll go a little bit deeper into the rankings. Uh, once we get to the Murray, Fournette, Miller early range. Uh, how do you guys sort those guys out? For anybody picking late second or early third round, where do those four guys in particular sort who, out? In who range? did you have there? Murray? Uh, Fournette. Uh, Fournette, Murray, Miller, and Gurley. For me, DeMarco is is head and heels ahead of, of those guys. I'd be fine taking him early second round, uh, mid second round, but for me, he's way, way ahead of, of the other three. I, you look at the, how this offensive team is coming together in Tennessee. They have like an elite offensive line, top three, top five ranked by Football Outsiders, Pro Football Focus. They have explosive weapons on the outside to spread the field and, you know, uh, Rashard Matthews, Corey Davis, now Eric Decker, Delaney Walker, and DeMarco Murray, you know, uh, uh, the concern here, of course, is Derek Henry as the number two. Murray in his own right had like 350 touches last year, so you can even give 50 carries or so away to Henry, you're still getting 280 to 300 touches from Murray behind a ridiculous offensive line, behind an offense that runs the ball as much as almost any other team in the NFL. So even if he has to split a little bit more work, where he's going drafted, I, I think is like a very safe floor for him. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff, what do you, uh, what do you make these four guys? I'm right on with Murray. Uh, I yeah, I feel like we would most most. I think we would all have Murray right about our number like seven, have, seven or eight running back. Personally, yep. yeah, I have Murray. Personally, I have him above Howard. Me okay. too. Uh, I might even have him above uh, Ajayi. Yeah, I have him number Same. seven. Yeah, I have him I, just above Howard. So. Yep, so, I have uh, Murray, Ajayi, Howard. When it comes to Fournette and Gurley and Miller, it's hard to take away the talent of Gurley because we've seen the talent of Gurley and we know it's good, right? It's it's just. Was oh you're, no! You're, guessing, you're a girly you're truther, guessing. man. I'm about you're, to you're I'm guessing. about to walk off the show. <laughs> it's like no, no, no. I'm just saying. It's I'm, like, I'm messing with you. Was it like lightning in the bottle, or was it real? Somewhere in between. I think it's you're going on. Yeah. This is year three, correct? right? This is third, you're going yeah. after, it's, you know year three. You had one really solid year, then you had one dud. But here's he, here's my thing on Gurley, right? When you look back to his rookie season, like no doubt he exploded, but it, it all came in this four game span. It was like yeah. these four games yeah. where he went like 100. It's not just like a Jaya. It was like Jay Jaya last yeah. year. Yeah, right. But the Dolphins' offense, better line, more scoring opportunities, uh, other weapons that that can take the pressure off. With Gurley, it was the four yeah. games, and then last year he like statistically put up the worst season ever. And I actually have an interesting uh, stat that I grabbed from from Twitter, and it said that if you are on a bottom eight scoring offense. In the NFL, your chances of becoming an RB1 are just over 7%. And obviously that makes sense, right? So that's something to consider when you're drafting a guy like Fournette, even Crowell, uh, Todd Gurley. Like, 
I'm, I'm like, the, the divides of running back one and running back two is, is touchdowns. And if you're on a team that is less efficient or less, you know, explosive, you're just going to be in the red zone less. You're going to score less touchdowns. Well, so it's just, yeah, a direct correlation is, is and, definitely there. And really what I was getting at with Gurley is that Gurley, to me, is the biggest risk. He's the biggest risk of this group. He's the biggest risk in this group because, you know, you might get that diamond again. And you might have a top five running back on your hands if he is what you've seen him do before, even in college, before before the injury. But that's why he's the biggest risk. And so he falls down. I like Ajayi purely based off talent and and opportunity. Yeah, good line. And and like like Lane Collins and the quarterback. Yeah, you got Lane Collins. They're going to have to run the ball. You know, so they're going to have to run the ball if they're going to be somewhat effective as an offense anyway. I like Lamar Miller higher than all of these guys. Okay. Me too. Because I like Houston's offense because I do think Sean Watson, that's a whole other argument, but I do think Sean Watson's actually going to start and he's going to open up that offense. For sure. The Miller problem was just touch. It was just touch. Yeah, I mean, Miller scored, Miller scored six total TDs last year. You know what I, I found mean, interesting there? And I'm uh, I'm with you guys on Miller. He's right behind Jordan Howard for me and he's a tier ahead of like the Fournettes and the Crowells and stuff. Like, I- I'm totally with you on Miller and I. it's a, a situation where I think we see this like all the time, right? You got Deshaun Watson, the rookie, and then you got some scrub like veteran quarterback who they're going to be like safe they're going to feel safe starting him so they'll give savage probably like three to four weeks for him to fuck up throw about three picks and then the crowd will get on uh, bill o'brien and say like put watson in put watson in then he comes in i think he really opens things up and i think what you got to really look at is jj watt coming back on d right they are going to get right back into that like hard-nosed defense ground and pound style of offense no matter who's yeah. at quarterback like bill o'brien they've been like top six in the nfl rushing attempts each year they're not going to ask either of these quarterbacks to really like put the game on their shoulders you know it's going to be the ground game and when I look at Miller he he's been good inside the five yard line they just didn't give him enough opportunities and I, I saw I think it was they didn't, they didn't get enough opportunities yeah. you know because of their quarterback situation well the crazy year. thing is is uh I was looking at it. Brock Osweiler threw um he had 30 attempts inside the t- or the team had 30 attempts inside the 10 yard line passing and Miller didn't see a single target out of those 30 passes Wow. Yeah. Know, as a Colts fan, I remember his, his one his one to rush his one receiving touchdown was like a twenty five yard sprint where we missed like six tackles. Typical Colts football. So yeah, absolutely. I like uh, I like Miller. Uh, I have him ten. I imagine we're we're kinda got we've kinda got these guys in similar spots. Yeah. Let me make my spiel about Gurley, okay? And this points to what you said, Nick. Okay. Last year was abysmal. I mean last year was terrible. I just looked up his stats on my phone. Three point two YPC universally it was a bad season. I called him as a bust last year. He got picked third in my league, probably similar uh, similar to you guys. Mm-hmm. So I called him as a bust last year, but I think it's rock bottom, and I think there's nowhere to go but up for Gurley because he got a better offensive line. He got an offensive coordinator who is competent. Let's just start with competent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> probably McVay w- would be considered a good, like top 12 offensive coordinator in the NFL with an improved O-line. And last year he... The one little golden spot is he saw 52 tarp, uh, you know, and he caught 40, 40, 41 passes and uh, got like 300 yards out of it. And Dunbar, Lance Dunbar, who they signed, has been dealing with a couple injuries. Yeah, he's I out. Early, Gurley in the middle of the third, I think it's a safe RB2 just because I think he has nowhere to go but up from last year. I don't think he's going to be a top eight running back, but I think he's a lock to be top 14. And if you're trying to get that in the third round, risk at a high spot. There's a risk at a high spot. But my problem is, third, is I think it's a, I think it's a solid pick. Not great. Right. But if Baldwin's gone mid third, remember, I'm not talking second. If Baldwin's gone mid third, I'd be looking at Gurley. Mm, I, I can't even do that. Dude, my problem with that argument, and I hear what you're saying, like it was rock bottom. You make that argument for a lot of people and then uh, they might go up, but their their increase in like statistics and performance is, is still very close to rock bottom. I just think, girl, all right, so Gurley finishes like RB18, RB19, right? And right now he's going off the board. His ADP is RB10. He's being picked as an RB1. I think that's that's insanity because I took a look at you know where he was last year and what kind of numbers he'd have to put up in order to hit RB10 and it was uh, Jordan Howard I think was the 10th ranked and he needed an extra like 45 fantasy points to jump up those spots and you know when when you think about it you're like ah maybe that's not and that's in half point PPR that's not that many points to make up right but but it is on, on a on a general level right that's like seven touchdowns or that's 400 total yards it, it's it's got to be a huge jump somewhere and i hear what you're saying about the improved line they added uh, andrew whitworth he's he's a better he's an elite pass blocking lineman for sure he's not a run block he's good run blocker but it's not his i wouldn't say that's like his his elite strength or anything but you have to remember he 
he, he replaced their weakest O lineman from last year. So, yeah. So it is. I mean, even if he's not a, a great run blocker, it's still a significant upgrade. Yeah, I hear you. I I just can't get behind uh, Gurley being much better. I just I can't see him where he's being drafted as RB ten. Yeah. It's so unlikely that he he would need to increase his numbers from last year by a huge amount just yeah. to give you on par value with where you're drafting him. You know what I mean? Not even not even go overboard and give you value back. Right. Right. So what Nick's getting to is that he's not touching Todd Gurley. Yeah, we get yes. we get the sense that he's only Gurley. I'm not going to touch Todd Gurley. Exactly. So I'm the most likely to, but I still don't even like him that much. Yeah. So I think it's just justifying think, yeah. his position, whether I touch him or not, whether it's a player I want on my team is a totally different deal. Right. Like, there are guys that I can justify taking sure. fifth round or the seventh round or whatever, but am I going to take that risk if I can find another player at similar or higher value that gives me... With Fournette, you're picking him strictly off volume. You're not expecting him to score 10 touchdowns Downs. As someone who's, you know, TJ Yeldon caught 50, 50 plus balls last year. While they wasn't like the most effective in catching them, he's still like, you know, they trust him. He's been their third down back before. But a couple of Fournette's weaknesses in college were, despite his size, there was his pass blocking and his his receiving yeah. ability. So his pass blocking, yeah, his pass blocking caught a lot of heat uh, in the in the pre draft sort of hoop block. And, and really, you're in a tier where. Just the way it works out this year, you're talking about like three or four rookies in one tier. You're talking about Brett Caffrey, Mixon. I'm not going to take Fournette at that high. Yeah, I'm going to wait until Dalvin exactly. Cook falls to me maybe two rounds later. I feel like yeah. everybody this year has their rookie preference. Yeah, right? exactly. I know I know who Nix is, and maybe we each have different guys. For me, it's Dalvin Cook because of the value. Love Dalvin I think, Cook, too. I think, Mixon, I think Mixon is the most talented back in this class. Yeah, we need to touch yeah, on Mixon I'd here like for a minute. Cook. I like Cook in the sixth round this year. That like in the late sixth, I think Cook's a good a good value yeah. for an RB two. Absolutely. What are your uh, What are your guys' opinions on? Do we have any like hot takes on Mixon other than you know? I, I'm sure we could all agree he's an elite talent. It's a pretty oh, yeah. It's a pretty crowded backfield. We have no idea. If you're looking at the reports, this is another reason why I'm like I wish I don't even you know. If I start looking at fantasy yeah. football in April or May, like you have literally no idea what's going on with Mixon. You've heard anywhere from. He's going to get 25 carries the first week to Gio and Jeremy Hill are both supposed to play big roles in the offense. Like, no, we have no idea what's oh, yeah. going on here. No, and this Gio Bernard thing is just nonsense. Do you mean hot takes in the sense of, like, uh, like what I think he's going to do? Just like just, just like an alternate point of view or argument that I have that, you know, that isn't, like, very obvious to the fantasy football one of world. One wild cards for me at running back. I, I, in terms of, I think he could be, uh, I, could, I think he could finish the year at number eight or nine. I also think he could finish the year at 25 or 26 because yeah, of course. You know, what would have to happen? What would have to happen for him to not be uh, a top 15 running back where he's being drafted around running back like 14? Geo explodes. It would be yeah, it would be Geo something. Or it would Jeremy be, Hill, do you know? Pulls yeah. his ass out of the it would be there. Hill vulturing Mixon. I'm, that's my biggest worry with Mixon is Jeremy Hill. The only thing that guy's good for is punching it in, yeah. and the Bengals. Are an offense that gets they get into the red zone, you know. Um, yeah, you gotta you gotta be a little concerned about their line too, because you know Whitworth went from them to the Rams, and they also lost uh, who was it Zietler? I could be I'm, I'm not sure the other line. The Vikings, I don't know, so yeah. They lost yeah. a couple linemen, so they're going to be a really shitty uh, offensive line up there. But yeah, man, like I actually have since we're on the the subject, I have Mixon ranked 13th as my RB 13, Gurley RB 14. Oh, you have him ahead of Gurley. Yeah, I have uh, Mixon. I think about 16. Uh, yeah, maybe okay. 17. I'm I'm right in there, Nick. I, I have okay. I have Mixon higher than I have Fournette, purely based off of Mixon is. It, it's funny because you haven't seen him play much over the last couple of years. Yeah, but I think he is physically a ready to play talent in the NFL when it comes to like the whole package. Absolutely. Like, is a powerful runner. Yeah. Mixon is just like, think, he's like Le'Veon Bell. He's like, he's an Adrian Peterson with more yeah. athleticness. Yeah, I think, think Mixon is the closest he's, thing I've seen to he's Bell. He's bigger think, Le'Veon yeah. Bell is basically what he is. You know what it so is? He just had floating talent. Yeah. Compared to a guy like Fournette, which I know what I'm going to get out of Fournette. Yeah. Well, for the most part, a lot of these like league winners, you think about like a Jordan Howard last year or possibly Joe Mixon this year. You know, Devonta Freeman from two years ago. These I, I guys, the yeah, yeah. Well, even that, but I'm saying like, you know, the ones that are, are rookies, especially, oh, they don't yeah. they don't immediately get their opportunities, right? So like Joe Mixon. You're gonna to have to spend. Most likely scenario is is Geo and Jeremy Hill will both open with with a role, right? And then maybe a couple weeks in, Joe Mixon takes over that feature back role. You just have to, you kind of have to play it by how much time are you willing to kind of give up on Mixon in terms of of 
of where you're drafting him to see if he if he pans out. So it's the same thing with like Zeke. Like if, if Zeke gets a one game suspension, maybe he moves back two spots. What if it comes out and Zeke's getting a six game suspension, right? Then then where do you where do you take him there? Yeah, that, yeah, that changes the game a little bit. And even with I mean, like I'm the I'm the kind of guy who when it comes to suspension I believe in still taking guys very high yeah. near where they're supposed to be because, like, you never want to be the guy who took a safer running back and he gets like Eight or nine fifteen points, points yeah. a week or something, and then after week four when the guy comes back, he's averaging like twenty, twenty-two points in a PPR league or twenty-five points. It's crazy because we've seen that we've seen this trend happen a lot recently in in the last couple of years, right? Where guys like big name guys, you know, whatever, Le'Veon Zeke. Starting off the off the year either injured or on suspension, yeah. and it's become such yeah. a big part of of like drafting and fantasy where you can you have to look to fill holes. And I, I think it speaks to say you draft a guy like Zeke right for like for three weeks, going to be gone, right? We'll assume it's three game suspension. You can look at guys like even if you hate Rob Kelly, right? The reports right now is that he's the starter. So for you'd have to assume for like the first week, two weeks, three weeks, even if he does eventually lose his job to uh, Samaje Piran. Those first couple of weeks, he's going to get starter numbers. So that's like the kind of thinking you have to have when you're thinking about like a long term, bigger picture kind of thing. It's yeah, not like, no, it's not plain no, black no, and white. You know, it's the same logic with Kelly. It's like, you know, these guys in the early first few games are probably going to get some touches. They're probably going to be yeah. involved in the oh, offense. I'm also a fan of hedging your bet, right? Okay. So you take a guy, it's a more of like a draft strategy in general. But if you say you have, you find really good wide receivers are still available, right? Take those good wide receivers and do something with, like, the Seattle backfield where you take, like, Eddie Lacy a little bit further back, and then you take Thomas Rawls, like, five rounds after that. Right. And you just head your bet that one of them is going to be good. Yeah, you're, you're, you're handcuffing it. Instead of jumping the gun and taking the running back because that's what you necessarily needed, and you can do that with any of these rookie, rookie yeah. running backs, right? You can take the bet that one of these rookie running backs, like Mixon, for example— you can take the risk of taking him a little bit higher than you might feel, com- feel comfortable, but you know that Jeremy Hill is an unwanted commodity right now. Yeah. You can take Jeremy Hill. So if early in the season Jeremy Hill is getting the carries, right. Jeremy especially Hill is those, those five zone yeah. carries, yeah, which he and eventually does. Mixon's going to take over for him. Well, at least you have them both, so that you're nullifying the risk of losing out four weeks because you just don't have a running back that fills the spot while Mixon's not killing. You. Yeah, it's, it's the same logic with Jordan Howard. I mean, Langford, Hill, these are not guys that inspire workhorse backs. They're not workhorse backs. So I think it's very reasonable, like what Nick was saying, Gio and Jeremy Hill start off with a roll. Mixon comes in and starts taking over those carries, and we see Bernard become the passing back, and Hill becomes strictly a backup. I think that is the most likely scenario. That's definitely the most likely. Like Gio has been too productive for long enough in that offense, and you look at a guy like Marvin Lewis who, like, he doesn't play rookies that much. They, you know, he's one of those guys that needs to be, uh, you prove it to me, you earn your role, whatever. Like he's <clears throat> he's got to be one of those assholes that ruins fantasy football for everyone else. But it goes to the fact that you know these guys aren't just going to straight up lose their role because you trust Geo passing, uh, catching the ball out of the backfield. So it, that's what makes like drafting these guys that that you think are like sleepers or have high upside, such as a. Samaj P. Ryan or a Jamal Williams out in Green Bay or like any of these rookies that you think could take over the backfield, it's difficult to draft them because you know that they're going to be sitting on the bench for four to five weeks and that, you know, right. that, like, that itch to drop them is going to be, just, it's if you can, you know, stomach the fact that you're going to have to sit on them for a little while before they, before they pop off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's our take. Uh, we got Mixon covered. We got Fournette. Those guys. We have them pretty similarly. You guys are a little bit higher in Mixon. You have them three slots ahead of me. But I definitely like Joey Mixon. And if I can get him in the fifth, I would feel good about it. Or Cook in the sixth. Yeah, um, I, I think with Mixon, yeah, I don't want to harp on him again. But I think by the time like real drafts come around, there will be the one guy in your league that loves Mixon is uh, you know to really bust out. So. I feel yeah, like you're going to have to spend a third round third. price. I've seen him go mid third. So. Yep, that's probably where he'll go in, in real drafts come like early September, probably late third. All right, so we'll talk about another cluster of guys taking guys like Green and Nelson in the first two, mm-hmm. or maybe Evans and Nelson, and then going running back three and four. And it's because of these guys, okay? Here are the guys Crowell, Lynch, Mike Gillisley. Talk about that trio. I like all three. Uh, I would say Crowell is my lowest of those just because of the offense. Um, yeah. But yeah, would you guys want to elaborate? Um, Crowell is funny because he's productive, but it, he shouldn't be productive. Right, right. So there's like I just look at Crowell and just go ew. 
Yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. He's just a guy. You think of those ugly Browns jerseys yeah, and the and one he, in 15 teams. And just the yeah. way he runs, he's just a hard runner, but he, you know, he's not burning you or he's not you know, running into He's nothing spectacular. He just produces, and that's great. And, and those are the kind of guys I have. Crowell is one of those guys that I don't touch because he's on okay. the Browns. He's just a guy that I'm not going to draft. There's probably a very slim opportunity. Unless yeah. he fell. Like if he fell down right. the rankings and no one else wanted to touch him either. Um, I definitely I have him uh, 15, so right above Mixon, right behind uh, right behind Gillisley. So I have Lynch actually the highest. Right. You know, I I rarely take a, a New England running back. Dude, I, I'm the Gillisley, the Gillisley uh, train needs it needs to hit the brakes. When I made my first big time. Yeah, because I was getting him in the. I love getting Gillisley in the fifth I'll round, ask, which I was doing I'll ask you all this. summer. I'll ask you this: Would you be surprised if Rex Burkhead? I, I, I know nope. Burkhead. Yeah. When they originally signed Burkhead back in March, maybe it was like February. I was like, "Yo, this is my sleeper." People were still yeah. talking about like 2016 fantasy. I was like, "Burkhead's my man for 2017." And my first, uh, I made like a top three sleeper video for each position, running backs. Gillisley was on that for me. His ADP at the time when I made that video was like 94. And I was like, this is, yeah. he's taking over the blunt roll that. You had to, but you had to, I had the same thing. You had to, we both had to know that that was going to rise. Exactly. And now it's where the point where people are like, Gillisley, you know, I would uh, take him in the fourth round. And I'm like, you're fucking insane when you think about the New England offense and how right. Bill, Bill Belichick is coming out and he's basically saying like, I'm putting together like a robot machine of running backs here that could play. Think of James White, Deion Lewis, not great runners, but they also have Burkhead and Gillisley. Burkhead's definitely capable of playing all three downs. I wouldn't be surprised if they used him like they like teams use a Danny Woodhead back there, right? Put him in the put him in the shotgun in uh, inside the ten yard line, and the, the opposing team is, has no idea whether you're going to give him the ball or pass it to him, because he's capable of doing both. So that's where my concern comes in. I can't imagine Gillisley getting anywhere near the 300 carries that, that Blunt got, you know what I mean? I just think there's too, it's too crowded, and it's Bill Belichick, man. You The only thing you know is that you don't know shit when it comes to the running backs in, in yeah, New England. It is tricky. I, I will say this, um, I would, there are teams whose running backs I don't, I'm not interested in, like the Giants maybe one, because you know the Giants have had a history of having just tough running backs to figure out. Here's my thing with New England. I did my matchup research, two different kinds. The, and this, I hate this. The team with the best running back matchups in 2017 is New England. They have one matchup against a team that was top 10 or elite against the run last year. They were sixth in rush attempts, and they had the seventh best run blocking line. Let me so ask they you something. Matchups, they oh. have the attempts. I know it's Belichick, but the thing that I think could overrule that is they have the matchups this year, which I hate. Because they just won the Super Bowl. But anyway, they have the running back matchups. They have the line. And they have the attempts. They were sixth in rushing attempts last year, which is weird. But it, maybe they're trying to it's, preserve Brady a little bit. I would, say, I would say I got a, well, I got a question after I say this point. I think it, it definitely speaks to the fact that just the Patriots just run up the score. you know, And it's always – it's going to be yeah. – every single game it's a run-friendly game script, right? When you come out and score 21 points and you're up by three touchdowns, why pass the ball? And it, it makes sense yeah, right, right in that sense. But let me ask you, when you guys are drafting, how heavily do you look into strength of schedule and things like that? Because I, I totally get the point you're saying, like strength of schedule, uh, you know, looking at it from, from a running back or wide receiver perspective. But realistically, every matchup in the NFL is going to be pretty tough. And by like week six, the teams, for the most part, you know, there are the elite defenses, of course, but the teams that are ranked like eight to, to 20, those rankings in there flip flop so quickly from week to week that I have such a hard time ranking or drafting people based on the overall like projected strength of schedule because I think it's a bunch of fucking hoopla and you're just and you're saying this thing just to put a number to it and give yourself kind of verification when in reality six weeks into the season it could be completely different teams within injuries and and depth chart moves and stuff like that. Well, so mine mine approach actually incorporates that like what you're talking about the middle the middle of the pack defenses whatever position it's against whatever metric you're looking at they are all very similar because of that i mostly just focus on how many weak matchups they have and how many strong and while i and while i'm not sure about how every defense is going to play out i can promise you that i would rather take a matchup against the green bay packers than a matchup against the denver broncos right we can all agree we have yeah. receivers so it's those extremities that i'm looking at i'm looking at how many matchups they have against the shit defenses against the run versus how many they have against the elite defenses. So I'm actually not worrying about those 
12 through 22 ranked defenses. I want to know the teams that, unless they made a drastic, drastic change, the teams that are still going to struggle against the run or the teams that are still going to be really So do you use that in your rankings or is that just like a tiebreaker for you? Yeah, it's it's sort of a tiebreaker. It's yeah. not my most it's not my most prevalent thing. Of those three things I said, I think the offensive line and the rushing attempts are more important. I yeah. think the fact that the Patriots were sixth in rushing attempts and had the seventh best run blocking line last year is a, a bigger reason for Gillsley than mm-hmm. the match. Volume doesn't matter if your player is awesome. Volume right? is a short term. Yeah, volume is a short term play. Talent always ends up winning out, and Absolutely. thus will eventually give you opportunity in the long I mean, yeah, run. Yeah, volume can talent can lead to volume for sure. When you mix talent and volume, yeah, well, that's, that's where you get your elite. Of course. Back. back to Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn Lynch intrigues me because. There are very few players in the NFL that I've ever seen over the last, I don't know, let's say 15 years that run as hard, stay in as good of shape, and produce like Marshawn Lynch does. See, that's, yeah. a, that's the thing about Lynch. He's like, he's like one of those few players that it's so easy to just be like, oh, you know, he hasn't played in this long. He wasn't good in the last season that he, that he did run for. But at the same time, like Lynch is one of those guys that – that has an intangible that you're just like at any minute at, at, during any season, if he came back this year and rushed for 12 touchdowns, nobody would be like, holy shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't think any of us would bat our and, eyes for and a second. If yeah. you ran out of gas, nobody would be surprised by that either. My thing with yeah. my thing with Lynch is firstly, I mean, he's coming back to an Oakland line that's that's very good, of course. But you look back yeah. at Latavius Murray the last couple of years, right? And Murray's been, I think he was like top 13 last year, top 11, a very high ranked running back the last couple of years. And he hasn't really gotten that much of volume. He hasn't been efficient whatsoever. Like last year, he was averaging four yards a carry. When you look at, uh, he had 195 carries. When you look at the other running backs on the team, they combined for about 195, 200. So same sample size. They were averaging like 5.5 yards per carry behind that same offensive line. So if you give a guy like Latavius Murray 195 carries, he hits double-digit touchdowns. Lynch doesn't need to be the full workhorse. He doesn't need 300 carries in order to return exactly what Latavius Murray did. Yeah, because the Raiders line, like you said, Raiders have a top uh, run-blocking line. Derek Carr and Cooper and Crabtree, we know they can move the chains. We know that they're a threat, and the teams have to respect that. And also, the AFC defenses in that division are stronger against the pass and the run by far. That's six out of 16 games. There's things I think that are encouraging for Lynch. He's basically my dream RB2. I had him at number 11, and I would have swapped him at 9 or 10 easily. I think he's in the right situation. I think the year off is an advantage for him more than a disadvantage. I was thinking the same thing. When this when they first signed him, I remember making the video and uh, I was so high on him. I was like, he is, in my mind, I saw the ADPs and he was going still like 50 or 40 and I'm like, you guys are, people are fucking crazy putting him as like an RB3 or RB4. I'm waning back a little bit on Lynch. I think he's a lot more boom or bust than the other guys in terms of like Gurley's kind of boom or bust, but at the same time, his floor is way, way higher than, than Lynch's floor, you know, because Gurley's going to get 250 touches regardless of, of what happens this season, right? With Lynch, it, it's hard to it's hard to guarantee over 200 carries for him. But he might make the most of those carries. Ex- that's, exactly. Right, that's, that's, that's kind of why he's like Lynch, yeah, that's, right? Lynch. So, yeah. that's beast mode. He is beast mode, and it's very hard to bet against beast mode. Yep. Yeah, you know what I mean. Especially on an Oakland offense, like we said, they get in the red zone. He's stepping into the right. Yeah, right you can't position. stack the box against Crabtree and Cooper. I mean, you're going to get burned if, they, if you leave them in one. If you leave both of them in one on one coverage, so yeah, I definitely like Lynch. He's my dream RB two, especially if I'm getting somebody like Bell or Johnson uh, early third round. I, I might even consider him versus a guy like Miller. That would be close for me. But anyway, if Miller's involvement in the passing game that is kind of a plus. I would lead Miller. But anyway. Let's get a little bit farther down. We got Christian McCaffrey. We got C.J. Anderson. We touched on Mark Ingram a little bit. Dalvin Cook. Probably a couple other guys. Maybe Spencer Ware and Carlos Hyde. We get into, I feel like these guys are kind of gambles. These are what I, this is called the gamble tier. But pop off, but I think they could also just be picks that you look back at in the fifth round and then you really curse at. You're like, man, I really wish I stayed away from this guy. I think, I think- both are fairly equal. Let me let me hear your guys' thoughts on those guys. So it's, uh, so it's Hyde. McCaffrey, Ingram, Anderson, and Ware. Yeah, I have them kind of in the same boat. And 
My problem with, with guys like Ware and Hyde and C.J. Anderson, they're not, not my problem with them. The reason that they're kind of falling down on the wayside and they're getting ranked near more near like 20, 25 is because the way social media works right now is that every expert has to write a sleeper about every like rookie running back. You know what I mean? So you're going to hear yeah. about Kareem Hunt. You're going to hear about, you know, Jamal Charles coming to C.J., uh, coming to Denver, Carlos Hyde, right? With Joe Williams or whatever, all this unnecessary Our buzz. Hearts and hearts and yeah. It's, so you, oh yeah, a high tower is actually a way better argument than Joe Williams would be. But it's like these stories are not that they're made up; like they are prevalent. But when you really dive into it, and when you look at it from like a common sense kind of standpoint, like Spencer Ware, C.J. Anderson, Carlos Hyde are like without a doubt. You can't say that they're not. They are the starting running back in their offense. So for them to keep getting pushed down, like at worst, they're going to get all the early down work, and for the very large majority, going to get all the goal line work. So I think like these narratives are being played out and, and the buzz around the, the people behind them in the depth chart is getting kind of to a point where these guys are like great values in the sixth or seventh round because there's a good chance that a lot of them get RB2 type volume, if not more. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, Jeff? Uh, how, do you, how do you sort these guys out? I mean, I like, I like them a lot and, and like I like McCaffrey a lot. Okay, yeah, um, I'm, I'm on McCaffrey too. Just, I have him right next to Mixon because of the, the pass catch. Yeah, just because yeah. he can catch the ball like crazy. Right. If you're in a PPR format, and he doesn't have to be the only running back on the field, yeah. which makes him a different type of player than some of these other guys. Carlos Hyde is not lining up in the slot nope. outside somewhere. He's not doing those things, which means he's not on the field as much. Jonathan Stewart gets banged up every year. Um, he's still very effective. But yeah, he's a solid running back. But you just they, they see the explosiveness yeah, and the big breakaway Christian, potential. Yeah, Christian athletes. McCaffrey is just a very talented player. So um, do you guys think – McCaffrey's ADP, I think, has cooled a little bit since the summer has started. I'm not even really sure where it's at right now. but Early fourth, uh, on average, maybe mid-fourth. I know like he was going as like RB14 and RB15 uh, like a month ago or so. I think McCaffrey's an incredible player. I think there will be no problem transitioning from college to NFL, and he's going to be a real talent. I might even take him first overall in a dynasty league if I had that pick. But the problem with McCaffrey is his, I think his ceiling is very limited just by small things. Like, again, Jonathan Stewart is not going anywhere. He's going to have a, a lot more limited volume, but he's still the goal linebacker, right? He's got like 40 pounds on McCaffrey. You saw him do it last year. He had, can't remember how many rushing touchdowns, but he scored a bunch. He was their premier goal linebacker. They basically have two goal linebacks between him and Cam Newton. I think uh, I saw the over-under for McCaffrey for uh, total touchdowns on the year by Vegas was like seven. It wouldn't surprise me to see him score like six. So while I think he's he's a dynamite PPR play, I think he's going to catch a ton of balls. They don't do that in that offense either. It was it was it was something like over the last two years, Cam Newton has thrown to the running back like the least of any quarterback in the NFL. So obviously that's going to change. You draft McCaffrey, so you tweak your yeah, offense. I think, I think maybe that's why. Maybe that's why they drafted McCaffrey yeah, partially. I, you know, yeah, I, instead of a guy like uh, instead of a guy like Mixon. Look at like Carlos Hyde. Now personally, I love Carlos Hyde yeah, as a running back. I like him too. I as a talent, yeah. Too, last year, I would uh, when Carlos Hyde was drafted, I argued that he might have been like the last pro ready running back since like Adrian Peterson before him. Yeah, I hear you. The talent's evident as hell when you watch him on yeah, the film. I was, I was praying he went to uh, Philly. I was praying they traded him to Philly this offseason before yeah, Legarrette Blount. I wanted him to leave uh, basically since he yeah, got he, there. Yeah, he could really thrive. Am I going to get five really good week Carlos Hyde? Am I going to get a consistent Carlos Hyde? Yeah. Or am I going to get uh, the rest Does of he get scripted out? Like, it's I mean, like, that's the problem. Yeah, it's, it out of three or there or four circumstances where right. he's just not getting the bulk of the load, and, and you just yeah. With him, it's so like you're not only you're not only worried about like there's a lot to worry about there. While you love the talent yeah. and you, and you think he's going to be the yeah. clear RB one, it's like like you said, there's high tower there to split. He has a pretty huge injury history. It's like the offense is not going to be good. How many scoring opportunities is he going to get? So it's like at right. a point. Like you said, they could, yeah, they, could, they could be a bottom eight scoring team, like you said. Right. So yeah. it's like that's – you really got to just be realistic about when you're drafting players. Like as much as you love a guy, you, you got to have a range of outcomes when you're drafting. Uh, for sure, yeah. And I, I think I think all these guys have worries. You know, we are worried about – McCaffrey's touchdowns. It's not to say that they're not worth drafting. No, they're, these are all pretty. These are all they're, pretty they're good all players. players yeah. to stay away from. Weigh the risk and reward of each player, yeah. along with their situations. I do like C.J. Anderson. 
Yeah, but the idea is last year he got hurt. Can he stay healthy? He, he hasn't. He just has never been able to. Stop he it. can't that's stay healthy. Yeah, you problem. add Jamal Charles. You I don't, think you I don't know what you're going to get with Jamal Charles. I think it's the most overblown story. Jamal Charles going to Denver. To be honest with you, it's like what is he like 31 coming off back to back knee injuries, going to a completely new offense, a new team. I, An offense that doesn't have a great line. Too. I just I just think yeah I think the Jamal Charles narrative is just at, like crazy. To be honest with you. Same with the reporters like making reports and like oh Charles had a nice day you don't sign Jamal Charles oh my god dude I I get so angry at fucking reports sometimes dude you have no idea like but you don't sign Jamal Charles not to use him agreed agreed you're gonna use Jamal Charles it might just kind of be like what Reggie Bush was in um, in Buffalo four or five uh, four or five targets or carries a game Uh, just to keep him healthy I could totally see him taking over that complete pass catching role which I think would yeah. be good, which and I think would be really good for us. A and yeah. lightning, a third down bad yeah. type deal. You, you're for getting sure. things that C.J. Anderson could, does well as, you know, as anybody. Because mm-hmm. when C.J. Anderson is on the field, he scores points. That's a situation that right now is very cloudy and gray. By the end of August, we might have a much clearer idea for of sure. what that's going to be. Yeah, and a few of these guys, there's going to be, just like Mixon, we're going to know more in two weeks than we do now. It's a lot of these guys, it's the other running backs. It sounds like what we're getting at is the other running backs and the situation. I think, is yeah. Concerning. I, I think, like, the, the key to that is really, like, getting into which, you know, because every, you could look at almost every backfield and be like, Oh, well, there's also this guy, and there's also this guy. But how how likely is that guy really to take carries? How likely is he to overtake that that role just based on, like, historical data from, from the team or the coach? You know, it's just, like, there's so much noise, and you have to be able to sift through it. Okay, well, I'm looking at the ADPs from, from, uh, from MFL, and McCaffrey's going 37 overall, running back 15. Carlos Hyde's going at 51, so 14 picks after, running back 18. And then C.J. Anderson's... 11 picks after him. So, C.J. Anderson and McCaffrey are like 25 pick difference here. That's true. That's true. So I, they've gone a little bit closer in the mocks. I've been doing mocks on Yahoo just because they're 30-second picks. And I feel like these guys, maybe um, I got a little off track as far as like guys who are being drafted near each other, but I feel like these are all guys who have question marks mm-hmm. and, and maybe have multiple concerns, and these are guys that could fall. People could just yeah. be a little too scared to pull the trigger on Carlos Hyde or Spencer Ware. The reason I like Ware the least out of this group is just because – of these teams, I think Kansas City is the most likely to just go into a commit. You know, they're just going to throw their hands up and Andy Reid's going to be, you know, you get some Sharkandrick West and Ware gets some and Kareem Hunt. Yeah, that's some. that's actually funny because Spencer Ware is probably my favorite out of these four. And okay. uh, I, I do think that out of all the backup running backs that are getting noise, I think Kareem Hunt is probably the most likely to actually steal work from Ware. But... I don't know. It's just that running back one in the Kansas City offense has always, you know, it's just always been a productive, a productive fantasy role. And, you know, we saw Ware have a big, big load last year. And it was his first year as a full-time, like, starting running back, right? So he wore down at the end of the year. But he, in the beginning of the year, he was a great runner. He was a great pass catcher. Andy Reid came out and was like, you know, he could do it all, right? He has this offseason. He has all three downs in him, right? He could do all three. He could block the point with Kareem Hunt. But I think... I think Ware still gets like a good 250 touches this year, and and he's still going to be a fine RB2, maybe an RB3 play. But, you know, the touchdown numbers have to have to increase from last year if he's in that same role. Both guys are sliding a little bit. Because I think if you had, like, if Ware was clear and consensus, number one, he'd be slid much higher up in the range. Just based off talent, what you saw from him last year. The guy was a horse until, you know, until he wore down. So now you're going to see, I think he's going to be more effective as a runner this year with Hunt, but you have no idea which one eventually is just going to take over the whole team. Yeah, and the thing is you get to you get to grab a guy like Ware in the seventh round, right, going pick 60 or whatever overall, and, like, it, it's the upside is so, is so there to have RB1 volume. So you're getting someone like that so late, whereas, you know, you look at a Carlos Hyde who's going 10, 12 picks ahead of him, I think there's more question marks there. I mean, at this point in the season, you know, we need to see a lot of the preseason games kind of come and go so we can get a more ideal, like, even, I I like to use the preseason more as an eye test. You know, I would never look at, like, statistics from there. Sure. It's it's the guy explosive. Yeah, exactly. Does he seem seem to know the offense? Like, do the coaches trust him? Yeah. Does he have a good grasp on him? Yeah. So we'll move on. We'll go a little bit deeper. Now things are going to get a little, little weird. Um, uh, we have covered, I think, mostly the guys that are um, that we're pretty confident—not fully, obviously—but we're pretty confident are going to be 
the top options that are going to be the number one backs. Whether that means they get 80% of the carries or 60, they're still going to be getting at least you know the majority of the carries in their offense. We start moving into guys with injury histories and guys with a little bit of hazy roles. And I'm going to uh, just a lot of kind of a mixed bag. This group is so the first one is Paul Perkins in the Giants, playing mostly in about the sixth or seventh round. The next is uh, Amir Abdullah, who I know Nick and I both like quite a bit. Jeff's a Lions fan, so we'll get his take on it. Um, hmm. The other player would be uh, Ty Montgomery on the Packers, and the fourth would be Dalvin Cook, the aforementioned, uh, on the Vikings. So I actually kind of like this group. Uh, I kind of like this group for their value more than the previous group. For me, Perkins is, is a very, very, very long, far and away fourth of that group. Perkins, I would almost That's stash in. You guys talk about Patriots running backs, Giants running backs for me are, are same. Yeah, same. Defense. I was going to say, yeah, Perkins is like, I'm just completely staying away from that backfield because I don't know what I'm going to get. They don't, historically looking at the last like five years, they do not use one running back. You never know what you're getting there. Dude, these ones are, are tough to uh, are tough to grasp. And I think it's format too. Yeah. Because personally, as a yeah. Lions fan, if someone has seen this team, it wouldn't shock me if... Theoretic ended up in PPR <laughs> higher than Amir Abdullah. Yeah, it wouldn't shock. In PPR, I mean, uh, Theoretic was like running back fourteen. Yeah, the top. He's, he'll yeah. end as a top twenty running back. Oh yeah, for sure. In PPR. In PPR. Yeah. So it's he's like, the most bona fide. I think Bernard's close and Duke Johnson's good, but in the Riddick really, is the most bona, bona fide pass catching running back it, in that. Event. And yeah, they run him out yeah. of the backfield. They run him out of slot. They run him all over. And I think and I think that's good. scaring people away from Abdullah. When in in reality, my thing about Abdullah is this: like I I was a true like, Abdullah truther. You want to talk about preseason, that one cut he had in his rookie season, in the preseason yeah. where he busted off like a 60-yard run, I was like, okay, that's it. He's my, he's my boy. I'm picking him everywhere. My What I find scarier about Abdul's situation is not knowing whether or not he's getting the goal line work as a as a – Opposed to the pass catching work, because look yeah, at that Lions. Reports about Zenner, uh, you know, it's it's just ridiculous. Yeah, Zach Zenner, I wouldn't. Right, you know what I mean? Like, and I get it. Abdul is small, and you want to knock him for his size, but one, he's not injury prone. He had the injury last year, but you look his rookie year. He played 16 games back in college. He was a full time workhorse, getting 300 touches yeah. a year. He was fine. Then you look at, at the Lions team. He well, fell off at the end of the year because he, he played injured with a with a bad shoulder. Yeah. yeah. So like he's been banged up in the NFL so far. You know, people will be real quick to to look at his his numbers in terms of size, right? He is the exact same size as as a Devonta Freeman, right? There's no difference in size between those two guys. Yeah, We've seen success from them. If you're gonna be a good fantasy running back, you have to either, you know, aside from getting the early down work, you either have to be the goal line work or the pass catcher. And it's hard to say he's gonna be either of them, but when you look at the right. the Lions' backfield, right, their offense, their rushing game basically is short passes. Their running backs over the last, like, two years have averaged collectively, like, 130 catches in the position, right? So even if Theo Riddick goes off pops, right, 75, 80 catches, which is very possible, that still leaves, like, 60, 50 balls for, for an Amir Abdullah to catch because, you know, you, Matt Asiata is not catching balls. You're not going to get maybe like five, ten receptions from Zach Zenner. I still think Abdullah could be fine with 200 carries and 40 receptions, right? Like for yeah, I think that's solid RB2 numbers. I think he has the talent to turn those carries, kind of like what we were talking about, Lynch. I think Abdullah with 215 carries, I, I like that, especially if, like you said, he's getting 45 grabs thrown in, too. It kind of reminds me of... Um, last year, like Isaiah Crowell, he was getting carries, and because of the Browns game script, he didn't have as many carries as you might like, but Crowell was also getting catches despite Duke Johnson. So exactly. Riddick is to Duke Johnson as Crowell is to Abdul. Even though those pass-catching guys are there, the main guys who are getting the downhill work, they can still grab enough balls. There's still enough to go around. Yeah. Right, that's a I good think, point. Yeah, I have Abdullah, uh, I, okay, I have Cook and Abdullah next to each other. I think I have them 18, 19, just above Spencer Ware at like 20. Ty Mott, 16, Dalvin Cook, 17, Spencer Ware, 18, and then I actually have Amir down at 22, and then Perkins yeah. is like 32 for me. I have, Ty at, I have Ty at 22, and then I have Perkins at 26. So now, now Nick, to your point, if I, if I could do a running back heavy draft, and I could pick Mixon as my flex. I would I would totally play Mixon at the flex. You know, I, I would do that. Big money or whatever leagues you play in. What are your uh, What are your formats in terms of rosters? Uh, it's half. I play half point, and it's um, two running backs, two receiver, one flex, one tight end. Okay. Yeah. See, I have uh, two running backs, two wide receivers, a tight end, and then we have two flexes that could be you know running backs, wide receivers. So uh, if I right. see value on the board, like. 
if someone crazy drops to me in the third and I already took two running backs, I have no problem whatsoever going like three or four running backs right off the rip because you know I'm able to play four running backs if I need to. No problem. If I could fill up, if the value on the board, I don't start looking other positions. Like I would never draft. If I get to like the third round and I'm like, oh, I already went two RBs and there's more room for me to start another RB and the value there, I, I don't stop drafting based on value until later in the draft. If I had two flexes, I, I would be in the same spot. Yeah, I, I started my last year's draft off with four straight wide receivers. Yeah, yeah. I, I did three receivers last year. You know, I had to. Uh, yeah, it, 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 didn't, so, uh, it, did, it didn't work out for me. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine. It's, it's not always worked out for me. It's it was awful. 50, but uh, we're going to wrap up with some sleepers, some deeper guys. We've pretty much gone through our top 25, I would say. Uh, maybe I know I have Perkins a little outside. I have Bilal Powell above Perkins. I know Nick and I we, we're on the same page in a lot of guys like Abdul and Powell. I know I have Powell above Perkins, and I actually have Riddick and half point just above Perkins uh, as well. And I like Woodhead in that range and kind of Dixon. But who are some guys that you can pick rounds eight, nine, and in the double digit rounds that you guys would take at the running back position that you guys would be targeting? I like uh, Thomas Rawls. Love me some Rolls Royce. Is that because you are against Eddie Lacy, or is that because you think Rawls is just like a better talent and will overtake it? Um, I think Thomas Rawls is a better talent than Eddie Lacy is mm -hmm. when Rawls is healthy and Eddie Lacy is who Eddie Lacy is. When right? he's fat, yeah. I don't think Eddie Lacy would drop the weight and come out gangbusters. He's being a awesome. He's hitting those right? little bench parts. But he has two other guys. He has Procise as well. To, to yeah, Procise had a little had a little pop last year. So, yeah. Yeah, he's a talented guy. So I just like Rawls. If any one of those three is going to carry his by week four or five, I think it'll be Rawls. I agree. Um, I definitely agree. There was a report today that came out from uh, Roto World said, yeah, Seattle Times' is Bob Kundota report. Thomas Rawls appears to be the clear number one back right now. You see, this is how it's just so crazy. You 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 read that today. Two days ago, I was seeing that him and Lacey were splitting first team reps. Yep, and that's the problem with like uh, fantasy football is kind of just controlled by – what reports Roto World puts out. Writers, yeah. yeah, so it's, if you take one report said kind of out of context, an ADP will jump up. And that's why I think like something like the preseason is way more important to, to kind of watch and make sure you're keeping an eye on it because you'll see the real deal. You'll see how coaches trust players. You'll see, you know, the eye test. If, if Lacey looks slow as shit, you know, that will catch up to him eventually in the season, and he's not going to be their starter for a long time. So it's just things like that. Talking about Riddick, right? I'll go somewhere in that area. And I love LeGarrette Blunt out in Philly. Me too. Now, okay, not to get to Philly. Okay. Cool. So my thing on LeGarrette Blunt is people are their first initial reaction will be like LeGarrette Blunt was good last year because he got 300 carries and because that Patriots offense steamrolled people and he got so much opportunity last year down by you know 18 touchdowns speaks for itself. My thing is. I'm looking at the numbers, right? Blunt's coming in. He's going to take over that Ryan Matthews role, early down bruiser and the goal line guy. Now, Philly, you know, they have a great offensive line, first of all, a great run blocking line, and I don't expect Blunt to get 300 carries, but I think 200 carries is absolutely attainable for a starter in a pretty good offense. When you look at the opportunities Ryan Matthews had, right, he only played in, in 13 games. He had like 155 carries. He had 16 carries inside the five-yard line, so 16 goal line rushes. He was fourth in the NFL, and he missed three games. So you prorate that out, that's like 18, 19 rushes. That's not that far below how many Blunt had down by there. So you're talking about a team that has a ton of opportunity down by the goal line. They add Alshon Jeffrey, they add Torrey Smith, another year of progression for Carson Wentz. And I think they're going to be like chain movers, man. They're going to be able to move through the field pretty pretty easily. And Blunt's going to have not definitely not anywhere near the amount of opportunities that he had in New England, but I don't think the drop-off is as drastic as people think it's going to be, and for him to be going in the ninth, 10th round, and, you know, he's a starting running back in the NFL that has secured a nice role in that offense, and I think he's going to yeah, put up good numbers. I, 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 I don't want to, if I hear, if I see one more report about Wendell Smallwood, I'm going to lose my mind. Oh, my I gotta God. Right now. However, I'm going to give you guys some deep names. So, I know you said you liked Riddick, and you also mentioned Rawls. And you said that you like LeGarrette Blunt. I agree. I think those guys all have upside. Blunt, I like the touchdowns. That offensive line is good. The offense added weapons. You know, we'll see what Ertz can do. I think he's going to be key to sort of like alleviating some pressure in the box. If Ertz can be a real, like, solid tight end. But we'll have to see because he came on hot last year. 
I'm going to give you guys two kind of weird, wacky late. I'm, I'm talking like last round guys. Okay. Uh, four waiver pickups that I think are going to make noise. I don't think they're going to be week to week starters. I think they're going to be daily fantasy, but they could pop off. Uh, one is Donnell Pumphrey in okay. Philly. Uh, this guy's a freak. I mean, he's a freak athlete, and he's tiny. And if Sproles is slowing down in any way, uh, Humphrey could come in and then just and just really make some noise. Another guy we were talking about the Giants running backs is Orleans Darkwa. Okay. Uh, there's been reports that he's getting first and second team reps. If there's anybody on the Giants backfield, I'd rather just wait and see and maybe pick up Darkwa because there's just been some interesting reports coming out of the Giants camp with him. So yeah. those are some later on guys. Um, and yeah, any uh, closing thoughts? I'll let you guys sort of a couple, you know, maybe a minute or two, and then, then we'll wrap up. So. When it comes to running back, is uh, there's a guy we haven't talked about. He's going late. Um, Adrian Peterson. Yeah. Don't forget he exists. Don't forget that he is still uh, a physical beast and can be productive. If you can steal him late, there is no reason you shouldn't take a flyer on him. This is one of those situations, I think, where... It it, almost, it happened to it happens to me in like New England sometimes it happens to me in like Denver where there's just so many good weapons that you mistakenly stay away from everyone when there's gonna be people that end up eating you know in the offense and that's yeah, very sure. likely what happens in New Orleans like right they're gonna be how many scoring opportunities is Adrian Peterson gonna get as the likely goal line back if he scores ten touchdowns this year I wouldn't be surprised at all yeah absolutely and, he, and Adrian Peterson he's not. You know, he's not a guy like McCoy or, or Riddick, but he can catch passes. I mean, Peterson can. And Ingram's a good pass catcher, too. I mean, the Saints have a wealth of weapons, and I agree. Yeah, I don't think there's a reason to stray away from them just because there's other guys around. So, yeah, Peterson's a guy we'll keep our eye on. We will get into running backs a little bit more later on, but our next one's going to be all about wide receivers. So uh, thank you guys for the first ever episode. No After problem. some technical difficulties, we got to figure it out. Nick Ercolano from... Hey! Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it. And uh, Jeff Mel, Sports Radio Detroit. I'm Julian Rose and Jay Rose. Uh, check us out next time we go deep into wide receivers. And the one after that is going to be quarterbacks and tight ends. Signing off from the feast. Adios. All right, cool. Sweet. We'll see you guys. See what comes up.